Hey there. I'm in a bit of a teaching rest right now. Um, I'll be coming back to Genesis when the Lord opens the door. Uh, which, I, I can't describe it. I just can feel when there's a flow and when there's not. Um, but I did get an email. I've gotten a few emails from someone who is struggling in a way that I believe is common to believers, and yet people won't admit it. So you don't get a lot of comfort about it or teaching about it. Uh, which makes those who go through it feel very isolated, alone, and it compounds the issue, and yet it's all God's sovereignty. Um, and so the, I, the, the thing is, is the guy is struggling massively with doubts of his salvation. And he's in this limbo where he can't deny the Lord. He can't deny that he believes that Jesus died on the cross and for, for his sins and rose for his justification. That testimony is there. But he can't rest in his conscience. And he's tried everything, gotten very angry to the point where he's cursing at God and he wants God to go away, you know. And he's in this agonizing limbo where he is so defiled by all his thoughts and all the sin in his mind and the hostility towards God and the unfairness of it all. And yet, he can't just walk away from being saved. And yet, he doesn't have the assurance that he is saved. He feels like, there's no way I could be saved and have these kind of thoughts, and I have no rest of my conscience, you know. And I'm, I'm, I'm speaking of it in a way that's not, you know, I'm not going to read his emails, that would be unfair, but Man, the guy is struggling, and and you can tell that he's being buffeted with winds of accusation from the enemy that are just nonstop. And uh, I know this experience real well. Um, I spent years in it, so I told him, "Look, everything you're experiencing is normal. You cannot deny the Lord." And you can try to leave him, but he's not going to leave you. And you're going to wake up every day to the reality that he's still there, you know. And I thought of the verse, and I said, Though I make my bed in hell, you are with me. And I thought about this psalm. Um, David knew this real well. He knew the absolute... Uh, dependence on God and the sovereignty of God in his life. And, you know, this is something that we really need to come to terms with before we can really understand God's love. And he lets us go through experiences uh, to test it so that he can prove his faithfulness and also show us who we are, you know. So that we can finally learn that his love for us is not based on us. In fact, his love becomes more and more mysterious in a way because we know what we are, you know. Uh, but we don't know what we will be, and he loves us according to what we will be, and he loves us according to Christ. He loves us according to his nature. Some people say God loves us because God is love. He doesn't consider the worth of the object. And that's one, that's a place along the way that you have to realize. According to the flesh, he doesn't love me according to that, obviously. Look at it, you know. But then we forget the new creation of God, the building of God, the habitation of God, the church, the masterpiece of God, and what we will become. The con many sons of God conformed to the image of Christ who spend the ages to come with God as he showers them with the riches of his grace and kindness towards them in Christ Jesus. We can't even fathom that. And that's our future. 
And uh, I've said it many times that God already knows the future. He's already been there. He's already experienced it. It's all done. All the works are finished from the foundation of the world. For us, they're happening. For God, they're unfolding. They're finished. And now they're playing out and being manifested. And he knows us according to a future that we've yet to experience. And he knows us as those who are holy and without blemish before him in love, predestined to be conformed to the image of the Son, glorified, heirs with Christ. And, you know, even the, we are the masterpiece of God, uh, workmanship, his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which he's before prepared for us to walk in. We are so focused on this life that we think that that means, you know, little things here. And that's part of it, I guess. But what about the exploits in the ages to come? When we have the nature, the perfection, and the capacity to match the Son of God. What exploits will be done there? We, we've we just been trained to think that the end, that like the end of our life, when we see the Lord, is the end. No, it's the beginning. <laughs> it's the beginning. So, but you cannot enter that knowledge of God's love until you really deal with what you are and accept his judgment on the old creation. We go from a journey. We go on a journey uh, of wandering. It seems like wandering on our part where God is teaching us to agree with him. On one hand, on the, first, on the judgment of the old creation, including ourselves, and yet his mercy and faithfulness towards us in spite of what we are in the old creation. And we learn to no longer trust in ourselves. Then, as we start to see his faithfulness and his sovereignty and how he led us and how he dealt with us and didn't cast us off when we were, in our minds, reprobate, we start to get glimpses of the age, the, what's ahead, you know. And in the Old Testament, what was ahead of them was their inheritance and what, for us, what is ahead of us is Christ and being part of the new city of Jerusalem, we see it much more clearly. Um, and we see his thoughts towards us, his love towards us, in a much, uh, and uh, in the light of a bigger picture. But for a while, we go through a thing where the love of God is just a mystery to us. Because... All we can see is what we are, and he brought us to that place. <laughs> That's just the introduction to understanding his love and faithfulness, that it is not dependent on us. It really is dependent on him, on his covenant, but what he has in view is a future that we can barely grasp, because it's when you can't think that, when you can't even believe you're saved because you're so bad, you definitely can't understand God's love for you according to Christ and in Christ uh, based on the ages to come and his, his fellowship with you that you haven't even tasted yet. You're still like grappling with the fact that he hasn't cast you in the lake of fire and going, oh, he's so merciful. So the thing we know first is his mercy. And his mercy is revealed to us against a backdrop of Sin, sin, sin. And unfortunately, because of lack of teaching or our own natural concept, when we come into the Christian life, we go, I'm a Christian now, so I'm going to be a really good person. I have to be. Uh, and so when God leads us through the part of our wandering where we have to discover our sin... It, it comes as a surprise to us, you know. 
And that's why people lose their confidence that they're even saved. And especially, it doesn't help that there's teachers that tell them, you're probably not saved. And most Christians say you're probably not saved. And yet, if you really are saved, you're going to be brought through this. In fact, it may be a sign that you are saved. Um, so this guy is telling me, you know, I think he's a young guy, but... I mean, he's, he's terrified and it's been for, he sends me emails every couple weeks and like he tried to walk away from God and he was so mad. I just told him, I don't, I give him short answers. I just like, cause I, I'm not going to meddle in his affairs and only the Lord can show him, but the Lord's going to show himself faithful. I know that I have absolute confidence that the Lord's going to walk him through, lead him through. And he's going to discover the faithfulness of God, the mercy of God, his, the assurance of his salvation, and then the love of God. That's just the journey the Lord brings us on. And I know from my own experience and I know from the scriptures. But anyway, when I was talking to him, I said in my little email, you know, uh, even though I make my bed in hell, you are there. And that was when he was like, I'm, I cussed out God and I'm just, I'm done. I'm getting out. You know, he's so mad. And I'm not, I'm not trying to laugh at his situation. I, I'm laughing in recognition, you know. And what we do when we get really upset is we start testing the limits with God. When we get really scared and get in the flight and fright syndrome of discovering our sin and wondering if we're saved, we start tempting God many times. Because if he's going to cast us off, let it, let's get it over with so I can get back to my life. <laughs> and also, there's a part of us that wants to know that we're safe. So we test. Okay, I did this. Is he going to throw me off? I did this. Is he going to throw me off? Two-year-olds do that, too, with their parents. They test boundaries. And apparently, seven-year-olds do, too, because my seven-year-old is really acting squirrely these days. Uh, what? The parent needs to show through all this is consistency. I'm there, you know. Um, and God shows us that, and the and we learn as children. The only way you can learn the faithfulness of God is to experience it, <laughs> and again, He reveals it against a backdrop of sin and your fallen nature and your crucified flesh and that you don't think is crucified or that you don't know is crucified yet. I know there's a lot of people who can't relate to that teaching yet in my, you know, we teach about the cross and how we're dead with Christ. But they will. If they're saved, at some point, they're going to have a reckoning with what their flesh is uh, in contrast to the faithfulness of God. They're going to learn his mercy. Um, but, so David said, I'll praise thee with my whole heart wrong psalm psalm 139 oh lord you have searched me and known me now i remember when i first started my youtube channel i made friends with a guy who emailed me pretty common regularly and he he was growing in grace but he really stumbled over the idea that god foreknew people because then we wouldn't have a choice in salvation. That's it. His whole thing was to sanctify man's free will to the point where you had a doctrine that God didn't know the future and so therefore didn't know us. So I'm like, well, that's miserable. You'd, you so want your free will that you don't want God to know you and you want to come to him as a stranger. You know, whereas I see God's love revealed in his knowledge of me. And David really meditates on that a lot in the Psalms. But you have searched me and known me. You know my down sitting and my uprising. You understand my thought far off. <laughs> you compass my past. and you're, In other words, you surround me. And my lying down. Even when I'm laying down doing nothing, God is surrounding me. Uh, and you're acquainted with all my ways. There's nothing hid from him. For there's not a word in my tongue, O Lord, 
that you know it all together. And this guy is emailing me. Maybe thought he was surprising God when he cussed him out, you know. I used to think, man, if you cuss out God, there's something, whoa, you know. No, all manner of sin and blasphemy against the Son of Man will be forgiven, you know. Uh, that's what Jesus said. Thou hast beset me behind and before and laid your hand upon me. So, just, I mean, this is his way of putting into dimensionality, three dimensions, space and time. God has surrounded him. And he's, he's, he knows him intimately. Remember, Jesus said he knows the number of hairs on your head. And uh, surrounds his path. It's interesting. He surrounds his path and his lying down. Path means you're going. Lying down means you're not going. Whether you're stuck or whether you're moving, God has surrounded you. You're acquainted with all my ways. He knows all my words. You have beset me behind and before and laid your hand upon me. Uh, behind and before speaks the future and past to me. Past and future. My past is beset by the Lord. You know, I have a path, but he's on every moment. He compassed the whole path. And so that means everything in my past is in the sovereignty of the Lord as well including whatever is in it. Uh, and now this is only true of the righteous. This is true of those who God knows. He doesn't know the wicked. He doesn't know the ones that be don't believe in him. He uses them for his purpose, for the sake of those he knows. <clears throat> but, and, and again, this mystery, <coughs> do we get to, choose to believe or harden ourselves in unbelief? Yes, we do. Are we accountable for it? Yes, we are. But once we do believe, we are known of him. And it turns out he beset the whole path. And that the scripture does not resolve that mystery. Both are true. If you deny that God beset the path, you are you you become an open deist or a, a Arminian where the sovereignty of man is exalted above the sovereignty and knowledge of God, and God becomes powerless to save as well. Because you, you chose your salvation, you can only choose it, you know. Uh, but if you deny the will of man, then you become a Calvinist and say, it doesn't even matter what you believe. If you're not one of the elect, you're not saved. And then if you're not showing the fruit... That the elect show, then you can't look to your faith as evidence that you're saved and what you believe, because you might not be one of the elect. Uh, you know, so all we can do is not resolve the tension and say both are true. God desires that all men be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. We may all freely come and drink. There's a genuine offer of salvation for everybody. Jesus is the propitiation for the sins of the whole world, not just the elect. And yet, for those who come and drink, these things are true of God's knowledge of them. Um, such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It's high, and I can't attain to it. And that's the mystery. You know, this is the uh, Luther, when he was talking about bondage of the will and saying there is a tension between the sovereignty of God and man's ability to... to or I wouldn't call it ability, his accountability to believe or not believe. Uh, and when man rejects the truth, he rejects the truth and hardens himself. And yet God hardens him. I mean, both are somehow true. The, this is a, something in the unknowable heart of God. <laughs> we talk about it, you know. I feel like every time I touch these kind of things, I have to spell out, I'm not a Calvinist. You know, because you can't say predestination without everybody accusing you of a Calvinist. Predestination is not a Calvinist word. It's a, uh, it's a uh, scriptural word. <laughs> Foreknowledge is God's scripture revelation of us and him. Okay, so, so but it's too wonderful for us to attain. It's high. I can't attain to it. You know, you try to meditate on the fact that God is so present with you in every moment of your life. And you really can't attain to it. 
you have to be strengthened within by God to apprehend his love. The love of Christ which passes knowledge. Um, this is something we grow in. There's a taste of it that we can barely understand. But he knows every detail at, at, as if you're a universe to yourself. He knows every detail. Um, where shall I go from your spirit? Where shall I flee from your presence? See, this is what this guy is telling me. He's obviously trying to flee from the presence of God. I've said when we get saved, we're brought into God's presence. Okay, but if you remember in the Old Testament, the priests were the only ones who could approach God's presence and they had to wear the special outfit and everything and do the sacrifices. And that's because of sin consciousness. The presence of God will consume you. And when we get saved, all of a sudden we are indwelt by the holy, unspot, uh, uh, unapproachable Christ. And yes, he's approachable now because he became a man. But it awakens something in us. The glory of God dwelling in us can make us very sin conscious. Where we want to be like Adam and Eve and shrink back and hide in fear. I was never sin conscious until after I was saved. Conscious, sorry. Then once I was, it was like, oh my, what am I going to do? Where can I go to hide from him? Uh, who shall dwell with the everlasting burning, you know? It scared me once I started to realize the implications. But I thought I, 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 thought I was going to be consumed. Where shall, where shall I go to flee from your presence? He, you know, he's not saying, I can't go anywhere where your presence is not, and so that's a protection to me. He's saying, where shall I go to flee from your presence? And he's just thinking about his past. David committed big sins. Uh, if I ascend to heaven, you are there, of course. If I make my bed in hell, behold, you are there. This is the inescapability of God's presence and care for the righteous. I mean, yes, even those who go to hell are in God's presence in a sense. But here he's really talking about the care of God. Uh, if I take wings in the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand hold me. Meaning, I think I'm flying away from you. I think I'm doing my own thing. I think I'm doing my path. But my path is compassed by you. Right? And your hand is holding me. Even if I'm flying, it's you holding me up. Even if I'm flying away from you, it's you leading me. What? And we're going to get into Abraham where in his wanderings... He goes south to Egypt because of the famine, which is clearly against where he's supposed to be doing. And yet, we'll see that he ends up acting out a type of Christ through it. Uh, and kind of foreshadowing Israel's history. It's the sovereignty of God. No, God doesn't cause you to sin. Your sin erupts from the lust in you, right? But God is sovereignly over all of your situation. If you're his, uh, this is true of you, you know, that you can't get away from him. And even when you're plowing through the worst part and you're cussing him out and you're trying to run away from him, he's holding you up. Even there, your hand shall lead me and your right hand hold me. Right hand is his hold, hand of his strength and his authority. Actually, it's Christ. He's the son of the right hand. Uh, yea, the darkness hides not uh, hideth not from thee, but night shines as the day. The darkness and the light are alike to thee. Uh, for you have possessed my reins and covered me in my mother's womb from the beginning. He's saying I'm. Re he's recognizing the sovereignty of God. Uh, I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works, that your soul, that my soul knows right well. Now this is where. He's starting to get a taste that even though he's dwelled in darkness, even though he could make his bed in hell, even though he flees from the presence of God, you know, 
because of shame. He recognizes God is he is God's workmanship. Uh, and that's where I said at the beginning of this message, you know, first we learn his mercy. He didn't cast me off when I did all these things. But then we start to see, okay, once I understand that he's not going anywhere and I'm not going anywhere, there's a safety that comes, assurance that comes. Then I'm in a position for him to start opening up. Okay, if I'm with him now, what will be things, things be like when there is no sin, you know? You start to realize, well, he loves me according to a whole history that I haven't even tasted yet. My substance was not hid from thee when I was made in secret. Curiously wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Now this is, in a way, according to the new creation. Um, it's a mystery that there's a new creation uh, that God wrought. Um, it's a foreshadow. He's talking about God's original creation of him, but we, we should think of it in terms of the new creation in Christ. Your eyes did see my substance yet being unperfect, and in thy book all my members were written, which were continuous fashioned, when as yet there was not one of them, or none of them. And members here, I, I've read different translations. I think it's days. It, it's in italics. Uh, it, you could say, all my days were written. And before they ever happened, it's already documented in the book of life. For those he knows. He knows every day you're going to live. He knows exactly what you're going to do. Nothing's going to surprise him. No matter how bad you think you're being or have been. How precious are your thoughts to me, O oh God. How great is the sum of them. If I were to count them, they're more in number than the sand. So the sand of the sea doesn't have as many sands as God has thoughts of you as an individual. And that's why I said we're like a universe unto God in ourselves. I mean, this is David's words to describe innumerable. God's thoughts towards you are innumerable. The new creation is the masterpiece of God that exhibits the very wisdom of God and puts it on display in all of the lives of the billions of saints that God mapped out. And when it's when we're glorified and built up together as the new city of Jerusalem, it's going to be well known and obvious, the wisdom of God. Because for each living stone in that city, it represents a whole history with God as if it's a universe unto itself. You know, you look at the universe and the sands of the sea and the stars of the heaven, it's innumerable. But his thoughts towards you are innumerable. And they're according to the days that were written in his book before there were any of them. He has a history with you that you are not aware of, that I am not aware of. I mean, we, but, but by revelation. It's already happened in his book and he's written it all down. And he deals with us individually and corporately in Christ, you know. Yes, he's thinking of Christ in the body. On the other hand, he's thinking of each of us. You have no idea how much he loves and knows you. The the Jesus, the shepherd, said, The Father loves me because I lay down my life for the sheep. The sheep are just as foreknown as the shepherd. We're, we're the reason he's the shepherd. I mean, he was always the eternally begotten Son of God in the bosom of the Father. But then there's us who have the eternal life that God knew from eternity and chose from the foundation of the world and loves with an everlasting love and gave his only begotten Son for. And how should he not also freely give us with him all things? This is our position in the Father's heart. Okay, and this is as close as David can get to describing that without knowing the mystery of Christ. Uh, surely, he, oh, and then he says, when I'm awake, when I awake, I'm still with thee. Now, it's interesting. Someone commented on a video I did 
uh, today, but the video was six months ago, and it was called The Simplicity in Christ is a Door uh, to Lead Us Out of What Will Seem Like a Bad Dream. <laughs> and uh, I was talking about the reality we're in, you know. The way out is the simplicity in Christ. To, to just be absorbed in his love and really be undistracted from him. And only the Lord can produce that. And that's called the simplicity that's in Christ. And yet it's a door to lead us out of all the confusion. And when I look back at the time, the years that I spent wondering if I was saved... And all the anxiety it produced and the anger and the fear. And I lashed out at God. I lashed out at my family. I lashed out. I mean, I was out of control. Spinning out of control. It was all based on not really having an anchor yet. And in, in the certainty that God is for me. Uh, and he had to prove it out. And then when he did... That door, that simplicity, he brought me to the simplicity of Christ. Simplicity comes from wearing out your natural man and its strength and proving God's faithfulness in spite of all your running and fleeing and flailing and cussing and fits of anger and fits of rage and fear. And you finally lose all your strength and you settle down and you become like a babe. I mean, you're just like, I'm just, too, I'm done. I can't do anything. I cannot do anything. And then while, you, while that's going on, he is showing you his faithfulness. <clears throat> he hasn't cast you off. You're an object of his mercy. And then you start to go, oh my gosh, nothing can separate me from the love of God, which is in Christ. Neither death nor angels nor things to come, things present. Uh, I am totally safe why because he loves me well it must just be because he's love because i'm detestable i've seen it now i used to think i was good oh no it's because he's he has actually created a new creation and it's to the degree that you know his love and are settled in his faithfulness that that becomes the door out of the bad dream and i and i go i look back at you know this guy emails me and i can I can relate to what he's talking about, but it's like a bad dream. I can't relate anymore. I can and I can't relate. I can relate from the perspective of one who's been through it and say, yes, this is common to believers. Uh, and yet, God's. I'm on the other side in, in terms of God has brought me through and assured me and anchored me in Christ. And now... That person seems like a bad dream. All the behaviors fell off to the degree that I got assured of my salvation. A lot of my behaviors, my bad behaviors and my sins and my were produced from a fundamental anxiety that God wasn't necessarily for me, that I could somehow screw this thing up. And eventually it was really knowing the sovereignty of God and his foreknowledge of me and that's why it makes me, it grieves me that Calvinism ruined predestination for so many people to where now if you say predestination, you're a Calvinist. It's like, man, I don't know how you know the love of God the way David did and the way I do from like Ephesians without factoring in God's knowledge of you. Just accept it. Embrace it. Don't rebel against it. Don't be mad because he knew you. Rejoice in it, you know. <laughs> he knew you from the beginning. Okay, surely he will, and then now he's, he now look at this. Surely you will slay the wicked. Oh God, depart from me, therefore, you bloody men. For they speak against thee wickedly, wickedly, and thy enemies take thy name in vain. Do I not hate them, O Lord, that hate thee? Am I not grieved against those that rise up against you? I hate them with perfect hatred. I count them among my enemies. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. And see if there's any wicked way in me. And lead me in the way of everlasting. Okay, look at his confidence here. He went from 
he he did this is a whole panorama of his journey of I used to run away from the presence of God. I was fleeing from it. I was making my bed in hell. I was flying away as far as I could. And I eventually learned that I can't escape and he's upholding me. And now I'm here meditating on, wow, you compass my path and my laying down. Oh, and he says, when I wake, you are still with me. See the dream, that whole journey is like a dream. It's like a bad dream. You get saved and then you go into this journey, which is like a bad dream. <laughs> You're already in the bad dream, you know. Your whole life of not being saved was a bad dream. But when you wake up and you realize that he is with you, it's it sobers you up and the whole thing dis disappears. It's like, I kind of remember that. I'm not like that anymore. I'm a totally different person. See, the knowledge of God's love for you and knowledge of you is transforming. It renews your mind. It brings you into the new creation, the, who, the, the person that God knows you to be. Uh, it's really important that you understand that everything you've been through is in God's sovereignty and his knowledge, and it was for your good. Uh, then you're strengthened with conviction to stand with God, and you can no longer tolerate the enemies of God's word and his truth. And you have to separate from them. See, when you're not so sure about how you are, you don't dare question anybody else. And that keeps you in the air, you know, error. That it, that actually keeps you in the limbo because you keep affiliating with people you shouldn't. And you keep staying in the systems of error. But knowing, having the assurance that God will bring you there is what strengthens us to be able to fight. Even when everybody in the whole world is saying you're evil, divisive people and you're, you know, you're the devil. <laughs> that used to wipe me out when I was in my bad dream. If somebody said something like that, I would just sit there and question myself. And But now I'm anchored. God has shown me. I've, no, I've learned something of how he loves me and how he's for me. If God is for me. Who can be against me? Who is he that will condemn it is god that justifies this is the same thing conclusion paul reaches in romans 8 it's the peak of romans 8 this is our victory and god is faithful to bring you there so i told this guy look you might want to read grace abounding to chief of sinners by john bunyan it's free online it's his autobiography of how he wrestled the way we wrestle in our mind and i believe it's a unique kind of wrestling that only saved people go through where their faith is tested, not as to whether they have it, but proven to be more precious than gold that perishes, even though it's tried by fire. And it's the, the, the principalities throw everything at you. The enemy throws everything at you. You're not saved. He'll hit you with, you know, the enemy can throw darts at you. Offenses, you take things people say wrong and, and it just eats at you and eats at you and eats at you. While you're being consumed with lust, you're bitter and you're angry, you're full of lust, and you can barely keep yourself from your sins, uh, you know, and you realize that everything you think is just absolutely defiled, and you feel like, how could God want anything to do with me, and yet I can't stop dealing with him, and all I can think of is his judgment. And you're terrified and you want to run and you try to backslide and you can't. You get angrier and angrier and you even test him and you cuss him out and blaspheme. Most people won't admit that this is part of the Christian life. It's definitely not something we see in the scriptures that's advocated, right? Do all things without murmuring, complaining, hold forth the word of life, but... This is part of Romans 7. Oh, wretched man that I am. The things that I would do, I can't do. The things that I hate are the things I do. That's where we see it. And this is a discovery of what the flesh is. The flesh is hostile to God. The mind of the flesh is alienated from God through wicked works. We were children of wrath by nature. And that, old, that is who the old man is, and he's condemned to the cross. 
And if we're going to continue before God, we have to be part of a new creation. But how do we know that's true of us when we are dominated by the flesh? Well, we have the testimony of Christ. This guy who emailed me, <laughs> the source of his frustration is that he cannot deny the Lord. He cannot deny that Jesus died, became a man, died, shed his blood, rose on the third day. And he knows that that was for his sins. And he knows he needs to enter the rest of believing it. And yet, for some reason, he says he, he just can't believe it. And for a while, he thought he wasn't saved. He, he said, I don't believe it. I don't believe it. But I can't deny it, but I don't believe it. I know that because the enemy is telling him, to, You're got, you got to look for a fundamental feeling in you that says you believe it. It's not a feeling. You either believe it or you don't. An unbeliever does not believe. Uh and will come against the truth. Okay? And at the end of this, look at how he hates the enemies of God who speak against God's word. Why is it so important to us? Because eventually, all of our hope is anchored in his word and not in our feelings. We come to a place where we realize I'm still saved. I know I'm saved. I have assurance I have eternal life. I've seen enough of the scripture to know that be, the fact that I have the testimony shows that the Spirit bears witness in me and I'm born of God. And I've learned no longer to trust in my flesh or my feelings because it's only evil continually, you know, when you're in this bad dream. But I've been awakened to the truth that I have assurance in Him. The only God can bring you into that place, you know. And when we contend for the truth and we, we come against hard those who deny eternal security uh, for the sake of those who are going through this journey, you know, the last thing they need is some false teacher telling them that eternal security is a lie from the devil. <laughs> uh, no, we are eternally secure. Hosas is the gospel in a way. You know, he gives us eternal life and, and our whole journey is discovering the faithfulness of God. And it may take 20 years. It took 20 years for me to really get to a point where I was so assured that God was with me and that I couldn't get away from him that I stopped trying and I and I finally just gave up everything in a way, all my efforts. And then something new came in, a new strength, a new fortification, a new satisfaction. And I started to understand his love a little bit. Uh, I don't know if this will help you or not. This is my meditation on this psalm today. I, I'm, I'm not in a teaching mode right now. And I don't have a whole lot of inspiration. Uh, but I hope this is a blessing to someone who needs it. Alright, take care.